So this is an overview of how I implemented the uh, motion detection um, in my uh, video feeds for my surveillance video feeds. Um, it uses a method that I think is pretty common to uh, commercial software. Um, and the, the gist of it is it takes uh, every other frame, well, every two frames and compares them with each other. So it takes one frame and then one immediately after and compares the two. And if there's some significant difference between those two frames, like something moved or a person walked in or garage door opened, then uh, it's flagged for motion. Um, the heart of that is being able to compare two images. And uh, I saw a lot of different ways to do this. And uh, eventually I just decided to implement my own. And I didn't know if this would run fast enough to work well uh, on a video feed. And it, it definitely does. Um, a lot of people used built-in Java libraries to do things um, and and comparing uh, brightness levels of the frame, stuff like that, and that seemed slower. A lot of everybody I saw on the internet, all the examples I saw were doing this on just static images, um, not something that needed to run as rapidly as uh, video frames. But what I did, and uh, I didn't know this would work at first, but I thought I'd try it, and it runs uh, extremely fast. It's definitely fast enough to run between frames of a uh, video that's only only you know 10 frames per second or so over the over Wi-Fi uh, it has ample time to run between it and there's no noticeable uh, performance loss um, uh, what it does is it takes uh, the two frames in and it uh, first gets the size of the smaller frame I did that because I don't want any out of bounds issues or uh, uh, any other exceptions involving the uh, the, the loop that's going to iterate through the pixels of the image. Uh, but in reality, these are surveillance cameras that are in the same uh, size image. They're not uh, going to change between the two of them, but I just implemented that in case I do use a higher resolution camera and on one feed. And that's the thing. Uh, these Wi-Fi cameras aren't really that high resolution. I think they're 420p. Um, I am confident that this would work on high definition, but it might be a little slower obviously it would be so i don't know I haven't tested it but for my use and for i would think most uh ip wi-fi cameras this would work fine um but basically what i do is i i take the dimensions of the smaller of the frame uh in this case they're going to be the same and i iterate through every uh pixel uh row by row column by column uh which like i said sounds extremely slow but it's not it runs playing fast enough to be between video frames and what it does is it takes the rgb value uh, of the pixels in of each pixel and it uh, subtracts the value off um, the it takes the absolute value of the difference between those two and uh, I did have to set some thresholds here so like the, the difference between the values if it exceeds this level or if it's uh, less than this level we won't flag it as a difference because uh, when I was first testing this I noticed it was sensitive enough that I could do something like uh, open the image in an editor and then save it without making a change and it would flag it as different uh, probably just due to the, the encoding that that software did to save it as another uh, JPEG or whatever format was enough to alter it from the original image. Um, so I had to add these thresholds in and then uh, this is a standalone project I made to uh, uh, show a visual representation of what this is doing. Um, so this is a little bit different than the actual one that I implemented for my uh, desktop client, which I'll show in a second. But it, it takes the difference uh, between the RGB values, uh, and then in this case, it averages them and uh, assigns the uh, difference of that RGB value for that pixel to a new pixel in another image, and then displays that on a frame just so we could see the uh, see the differences. So these are the two images I'm going to compare. Um, they're identical right now. Uh, this is me at the uh, racetrack uh, a couple months back. They're identical right now, and so not remarkably, uh, if I run this, uh, we don't see a difference. It's just black. And then uh, if I'm to make a uh, small change in this image and then save that, and we run this again, we'll get a uh, output uh, the pixels that were different are marked that yellow value coming from the uh, the difference uh, the absolute value of the difference in the RGB values for those pixels uh, so the number of pixels here that are flagged as different is uh, divided by the uh, total pixels that's what this is doing there are 253 pixels that were marked as different that exceeded the threshold and uh, of the total pixels in the images and uh, 
that percentage gives me my threshold for if motion was detected or not. Uh, so in my uh, actual motion sensing class here, it doesn't create uh, another image to display. It just returns that difference uh, percentage. And then in my camera class, uh, if motion sensing is enabled, which I'll talk about in a second, um, then the uh, image is checked. If it exceeds the threshold value for motion, then it's flagged, and then uh, an email alert is sent. Um, now, I, I have this delay here, this 1,000 uh, milliseconds, so one second delay here, because I, I found out in my testing, and I probably should have known this, but if I were to walk into my garage camera's view, uh, I would get an email alert with a picture of the motion that was detected, and my, like, finger or my wrist would be in the corner or like my you know just the smallest change in the corner of the frame um, which is good I want it to detect that kind of motion and obviously the threshold is higher than things like noise or a bug or something really small coming in but if I you know my wrist or my forearm doesn't really help me identify what's going on so I put a delay um, and one one second might change that might be too long or too short but in my case, this would give me a much better, like if I walked into the frame, the picture I would get would be of me as I get into the frame a second later. Or in the case of my garage door opening, if it flagged it as motion and the garage had moved, you know, a centimeter or two, that wasn't enough uh, to really see it quickly, see what's going on. So one second delay, I get a picture of it halfway open and I definitely know that the garage was opening is what flagged the motion. Uh, so that's why I put in this delay. And then... Uh, it just uh, takes that image, scales it, and then uh, sends it to uh, my email address um, via this emailer class, which just uses my Gmail account through SMTP and a subject line that says uh, attached or screen captures the motion and with the name of the camera so I know which view uh, came from. And then uh, through the same motion alerting, I'd like to implement that uh, my Android app will get an alert uh, that doesn't delay. There's no email and no like uh, waiting for it to go through an email, so it would be direct uh, to my Android app uh, via the web service that will give me a you know a vibrate and or a tone and tell me there's motion sensed. And then I can just open up the Android app, go to that camera view that set off the alert, and then uh, see what's going on with it. So that's an overview of how I implemented this motion sensing algorithm. Um, like I said, there were other methods. People used a built-in RGB value uh, class from Java that uh, was way too slow, and it gave me way more information than I needed. I'm sure it's great for other uses, but for this, I just needed very basic, quick information. So this runs pretty well, and uh, I'm pretty happy with how it worked. Again, the code for this will be available publicly at some point. I just need to uh, uh, get all my get all my stuff out of there, all my hard-coded authentication and other things like that out of there, and do... Uh, a publicly uh, releasable version with the configuration menus and things like that. So, all right, I think I'm going to go over my uh, Android uh, client now, and then uh, we'll get into some of the hardware.